If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Romans chapter 7. We started chapter 7 last week, uh, went through the first 13 verses, and we'll go through the remainder of the chapter tonight. And I just want to give a quick review of some key points that we had last week, maybe summarize those and then move on. Uh, so last week, Paul was explaining that we must die to both sin, which he had talked about previously, but also to the law. So we are not uh, enslaved to the law as Christians. Uh, prior to chapter uh, 7, he had only been talking about dying to sin. Uh, but it's our death to sin that sets us free from the law. So there are, he's building upon this principle, this concept of uh, freedom because of being free from our sin. But now also the natural course of that is also to be free from the law. And then we talked about <clears throat> when we do die to sin and the law, that there's freedom to live in the newness of the spirit. And I think that's a key point that Paul is trying to make, not only uh, because not only do we die to sin and die to the law, there has to be something new to replace that, and that's the newness of the Holy Spirit, and that we uh, are to live in that and act and react with the power of the Holy Spirit and the newness that it brings. Uh, the word new is important there because we talked about the old man, you know, and the old, uh, the law, which is the old covenant. Uh, now we are looking at the newness of the Holy Spirit and that relationship of grace through uh, what Christ did. Uh, <clears throat> just a couple more points. If we don't die to sin and the law, then we will have a tendency to cross the boundaries that God has set for us. I mean, knows that even though the law is we're in a new covenant. God still has boundaries. We're not supposed to live just however we want to and do whatever we want to. Uh, that we, if we don't die out now, how many knows this process of dying to sin and to the law is a continuing thing, right? If we don't just die to sin one time, but we die to sin daily. Paul says, I die daily, right? Uh, so, uh, if we don't die to the law and to sin, then we, we will have a tendency to cross the boundaries that God has set for us. So, and then finally, the last point, which kind of ties into tonight as we go forward, is that we must recognize our fleshly tendency to sin. Now, I, I want to hear the word fleshly tendency to sin, because uh, we ended last week saying that sin tries to hide out in us uh, because it doesn't want to be revealed because if sin in us is revealed, then we can take care of it, right? We can uh, get rid of it. Uh, so the only way to kill uh, sin in our life is to understand and be not notice whenever uh, sin tries to rise up in us. Have you ever, ever started to just blow up and just tell somebody like it was and then the Holy Spirit checked you, right? Uh, that's, that's that tendency that we have, but we also have the Holy Spirit to check us and direct us and guide us and do all those things that the Holy Spirit does. So let's look at verse 14 of chapter 7 in Romans. And it says this, For we know that the law is spiritual. So Paul saying the law is spiritual. It's not bad. It's not, uh, matter of fact, we know that the law is good because it reveals sin, right? Uh, so for the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, soul under sin. And so uh, I think the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, Paul is saying he's carnal. Does that mean he's saying he's a sinner? Shaking their heads and everybody saying no when they with their heads. Uh, carnal does not necessarily mean sin, right? Uh, so Paul is, is not saying that he's carnal. As a matter of fact, his awareness 
of his carnality is proof that the Holy Spirit is still working in him, right? Uh, if we recognize our carnal tendencies, then that means that the Holy Spirit is working in us, pointing those things out, right? And, and helping us to live uh, a life that we, uh, that God has called us to live. So what does the word carnal mean? Uh, but carnal simply means of the flesh. That's what that word means. So, uh, so Paul is recognizing that the spiritual law cannot help a carnal man. So we have, uh, we have a tendency, uh, we have tendencies, and we've talked about this throughout the book of Romans, uh, that we, uh, we have, I'm going to say, old paths that the old man used to take, and we have to reroute that thinking and reroute that what we do, uh, and it's through the, the help of the Holy Spirit. So Paul's saying he's sold under sin. He's under bondage. To sin, uh, like a man that's been arrested for a crime and thrown in jail. Now, I started by saying that carnal does not mean that he's a sinner. And I want to keep pointing that out because if you keep looking at this, Paul is like very much describing his struggle with sin. But can I tell you that struggling with sin is... A good thing that means that you're you know it's wrong you don't want to do it but you do still have the flesh you're you are carnal you are the flesh until you die and are resurrected and have a new body right uh, now we've talked about all along that does not give us the uh, right or the, the we should just want to live in sin right we should want to live uh, like God's called us to do. So Paul's saying, I'm, I'm sold under sin. So let's read verses 15 through 19. And you see this struggle in Paul's mind. And if we're, I, I think if we're truthful with ourselves, we go through some similar struggles in our mind. I want to do this, he's saying, but I end up doing this. Uh, and sometimes we, that happens. To us, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will, I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But why does he say the law is good? Because it's pointing out what's wrong to do, right? It's pointing out that uh, this is sin. Uh, to do this particular thing. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do it, but the evil I will, I will not to do that I practice. So uh, as we look at these verses 15 through 19 of chapter 17, Paul is saying that I have a problem. It's an internal problem that he has. He's struggling with to do what is good and to do what is right, but yet at times he ends up not doing those things. Uh, and so we see that, but as we look at this, I, I, I've got to point out, it's, we, we know the character of Paul from reading his writings. He's not an evil, bad man, but yet you see this struggle that he's t telling us about. And I think he does it because he talks about this because all of us at some point or another have this internal struggle I want to do this, but it seems I end up doing this. Uh, so I want you to know that Paul doesn't have, a, it's not a lack of desire on Paul's part to do what is right. And that is in your questions, by the way. Uh, it's not a lack of desire. Uh, it's not a lack of uh, knowledge. 
that he doesn't know the right thing to do. So what is it? Why does why can he not do what is good and ends up doing what is bad? Why why do we have a tendency at times to do that? I'm not saying we live in that, but I'm saying we still have a tendency and have a struggle. So we have to crucify our flesh daily and pick up our cross and follow him. We we certainly have to do that. And uh, that is only cake possible if we're living in the newness of the Holy Spirit that he talked about earlier. But the other thing is that if we try to do this, remember Paul is a good Jew, right? He grew up as a Jew, was trained under the best teachers of Judaism, and he still has this internal struggle. If you were raised a certain way, how many knows that's hard to break, right? So he still has this internal struggle because he's trying to depend upon the law to help him to do good. That's what, he's, that's what he's trying to do. But the problem with the law is it does not contain any power to do good. The law doesn't have any power to do good. The law simply points out what is sin and what is evil and what is wrong, right? Uh, so what, how do we get the power to live this way? just described it to us last week the newness of the Holy Spirit right that new life that we can live under the power uh, of the Holy Spirit so the law tells us here are the rules keep them but it doesn't give us any power to keep them right uh, so then Paul goes on to say I, I know law it is no longer I who do who do it in other words, I'm not really the one sinning, but sin still dwells in me. So is Paul trying to get a, an out for this sin that he says dwells in him? Oh, it's not me. It's just sin, right? I mean, is, is that what he's trying to do? No, he's recognizing that when he does sin, which should not be a continual life of sin, I keep wanting to point that out. Uh, when he does sin, and it's occasional and rare, uh, we've said, then he is acting against the nature of the new man that he is in Christ. So, as a Christian and a new man in Christ, this is my nature. Occasionally, rarely, hopefully, not nearly all the time, I might act outside of that character. But it's not really the new me and the real me. It's the old man and the old way and the old uh, light that I sometime might revert to occasionally. Uh, so as we look at this, Paul's saying, I'm acting against my true new nature when I sin. So a Christian has to own up. I mean, those we have to own it when we sin. If we sin, we need to own it. Confess it. Say we did it, right? Uh, I'm not one who thinks that we, although the Bible does says, says confess your sins before one another, uh, I think you need to be very careful if you're doing that. <laughs> not everybody should you tell your sin to. Some people you can trust and some people you cannot. Uh, that's just the truth of the matter. I believe we certainly ought to confess our sin before the Lord. And maybe those people who are uh, our accountability people are those who that we trust, those we've prayed with and they've prayed with us, you know, uh, those, those kinds of things. So we must own our sin. And that's in your questions, by the way. Uh, but in the same route, we must also disown it. That's really what Paul is saying here. He's saying uh, that I have this occasional tendency to live outside of the new me. And when I do, I need to confess it, but not just confess it and continue to live in it. So I need to own it, but I also need to disown it. What does that mean? Confess it and get rid of it. 
get rid of it. If you disown someone who's your kin, you no longer associate with them, right? Hopefully you don't, you haven't had to do that. Uh, but I mean, that's a, that is, we know what that word means. So we, Paul's saying, own your sin when you do sin, confess it, and get rid of it. Don't keep going back. Reminds me of a verse in the Bible that talks about a dog going back to his vomit. Because he will. They're nasty like that. They will do that. Uh, and it's, it's weird. The, the, the way to defeat the carnal mind has to end in obedience. But the way we defeat the carnal mind is, in my opinion, if you're asking my opinion, Romans 1, Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says that we're, it says that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. And how, how, how does that happen? Reading the, Reading the word, our relationship with the Lord, and being obedient. Right? You know, he does, it's like Cain and Abel. One was obedient, one wasn't. Right. Right. You have to be obedient. God wants what he wants. Right. He doesn't want what you want. He wants what he wants. And, and the big part of what Paul is saying here is that we know we need to obey, but something about our old nature occasionally tries to rise up and we have to cut it off and we have to disown it. But the only way to really do that is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you can know you're not supposed to do something and just keep doing it. Yes. Addicts do that all the time, don't they? Right? I know I shouldn't take this drink. I know I shouldn't do this drug. I know I shouldn't, but I, I don't have the power to keep from doing it just because of the law. The law reveals its sin, condemns me, but it doesn't help me other than to know what sin is. What helps us is the power of the Holy Spirit in our life, right? Uh, so Paul, that's what Paul is talking about. This, we're going to read verses 20 through 23. And you see this battle, if you will, between the two selves. The old self and the new self. And, and, and we're going to, let's read this. So now if I... Well, we've already, we've already read that. Uh, no, I didn't. Did I? No. No, I did not. Okay. So now, if I, because it, it, it's almost like he's continuing this argument, this uh, thing. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me. Notice he's not saying that it lives in me. But is present with me. The one who wills to, to do good. For I am, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. What's he saying? Who's that inward man? That real man, that changed man, that uh, Christian man who is being, yes, who's being uh, uh, I want to say uh, that the Holy Spirit lords over us. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm saying he helps us. He's supposed to help us uh, to live like we ought to. So I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members. What are members? We talked about that a couple weeks ago in our body, right? Our members literally are like eyes, ears, nose. How many knows that we, we, have, we have flesh bodies and, and we can sin? And sometimes our eyes will misguide us. We'll see things that we want to do and we shouldn't. Or we'll have a tendency, if we don't watch out, to listen to things that we shouldn't. So uh, I see another law of my members warring against the law of my mind. When he's talking about mind, he's talking about that internal, not just his physical mind, but that mind that has been transformed and has been changed because of the new man. So I see this uh, and warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. C.S. Lewis wrote this, and I think it's very true. No man knows how bad he is until he's tried to be good. Isn't that true? <laughs> when, when, when we try to be good, 
What's he saying here? In our own strength, right? When we try to be good without the help of the Holy Spirit, we can't do it. But we have to have the, the help of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, seven, Romans 7, 24. We have a tendency to make light a little bit of this internal struggle that Paul is revealing to us. Like he's showing us a different side of him than normally caught in the scriptures. And when he says this, I mean, I can sense his, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? So Paul is saying, this is no joke. I'm really struggling with sin. I'm not a sinner, but I'm really struggling. There's this struggle with sin. And I think that primarily was because of his tendency to, I can't help but think he had a tendency to go back and depend upon the law because that he's, he's Jewish, right? And imagine if somebody says, everything that you used to believe about the law, it's now changed. Well, it's killing yeah. people. He was, yeah, people. I mean, he was sold out to the law, right? Because he thought it was um, treason, essentially, to the Ju Judaism, to this Christian faith. He thought it was... Uh, blasphemy and all this kind of stuff. So he comes and he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Uh, so the word wretched, we always think of wretched being, and, and, and there is that connotation. But here, when you look at this word, it's an ancient Greek word. We always think wretched, we think vile and evil. And there is an aspect of that in our language. But wretched in the ancient Greek here, this word means worn out because of unsuccessful effort. That's why he's saying, I'm just totally worn out. If you want, can I put in my words? Paul's saying, I'm worn out from this struggle. It's not, he, he's not saying, I'm not a Christian and I'm about to fall. He said, this is a real struggle. He's explaining to us this real struggle. Uh, and I think that unsuccessful effort is trying to please God under the principle of the law. So if you're trying to please God and you kept 612 out of the 613, but you missed one, you messed up, you did something you weren't supposed to do, what will your mind tell you? My bother. How, yeah, I mean, it's going to say there's 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 two things. By the way, that's called legalism. And I'm glad we don't live under the legal aspect of the law. I'm not saying it doesn't apply to us, but we live by grace through faith. God helps us to keep His law, right? Uh, and <clears throat> if we don't watch out, then we have two tendencies. We'll either deny that we have a tendency to sin ever, which would be self-righteousness, like the Pharisees. And a lie. And a lie, yeah. Yeah, if you say you have no sin, you're a liar, right? Uh, the Pharisees were so self-righteous that they didn't just like the 600. They were responsible, by the way, for most of the 613. They took the law and they would say, okay, remember, honor the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Well, what does that mean? How do you do that? Well, you can't walk more than this many paces. You can't, like, do what Jesus' disciples would. And how, by the way, how many have, have watched Cho the, the Chosen? Man, that's so good. I encourage you to do that. It's really, really good. And it gives you a different perspective on Scripture. Some creative license in there, but I mean, it could be. Um, so you either have a tendency to be self-righteous or you have a tendency to give up and quit trying to please God if you're legal, legalistic, right? Uh, I'm not saying you don't follow the law. I'm saying if you're doing it in your own power and not through the Holy Spirit, then you'll have a tendency. How many have met people who 
were just so self-righteous, you just like you just wanted to slap them and see if they'd get mad. Because uh, <laughs> they will. But anyway, uh, so you have a tendency, and Paul is saying, I'm, I'm, a, I'm wretched. I'm desperate for deliverance. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Uh, who will deliver me? So notice Paul is not saying, this is like, you can see the progression of this. Paul's not saying, how am I going to be delivered? How am I going to fix this problem? He's saying, who will? This is a good, this is a good turn in, the, in this thing because now he's like, I can't do it myself. So who is going to deliver me? Well, we know the answer, right? Yeah, that wasn't really a question. That was just saying, yeah. you've got a question. Let me give you the answer. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. A lot of writers do that. They ask the question, what kind of question they call it? Uh, rhetorical question right. uh, that they know the answer to, but it's, it makes you stop and think and, and, uh, and be, you know, uh, dig in and figure it out. So <clears throat> when Paul describes, now I found this very interesting. I, you'd think in the history of Christianity and, and all the history that I've taken that I would have ran across this, but I did not. Paul says, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Did you know that the ancient tyrants before him, before Paul, before this day, when they wanted to punish someone, say this really bad criminal or whatever, they would literally tie a dead body to them. Just imagine that. They time back to back so that you had to carry this putrid, decaying body with you. What a word picture this is. I mean, this is an amazing illustration. It's, it makes you almost sick, but I, I mean, that's what Paul's saying is we're trying to carry around this old, you know, self, this old, who's going to deliver me from this dead body, you know, this, this thing I'm trying to do on my own. Who's going to deliver me, right? Uh, and they would strap it to him, uh, and Paul's, it, it, what he, the picture here is that <coughs> he's saying that's what, in a way, that's what the Christian has to do. He has this new life that he's living, and he's living under those principles, but at times... We have that old body, that old man, that old uh, dead body of death that we're trying to drag along and make him do right. What a, what a picture, right? Uh, it's kind of gross, honestly. But uh, so there's this, he's Paul saying, What's, what am I going to do with this body of death? And this dead uh, old man. This abominable carcass that is attached to me. That's the flesh, right? That's the carnality that he started uh, talking about. Verse 25. Paul finally, remember I said, he said, who, not how can I? Who will deliver me? So Paul's finally looking outside of himself to the only one that can help him, and that's Jesus, Right? The only one that can help us live a godly life is Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, and he says, I thank God. So now he's like, thank God there's an answer to all of this, to this struggle, uh, that it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he says, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. This duality of, that we all live in. Hopefully, we live for the Lord more than we uh, submit to the flesh. Uh, I would certainly uh, you, you need to uh, <laughs> you need to have some change if you're not. Put it that way. So he's thanking the Lord uh, for this help that God gives us to overcome sin, to not live by the law, and to not live carnally. Is, is what he's thanking the Lord for. So uh, Paul
Paul is looking, I know this is on your question, he's looking outside of himself, he's looking beyond the law to Jesus as his help. That's the answer to this internal struggle. And it is for all of us. If we uh, look outside of ourselves, in other words, I, I can't do it on my own, and the law won't help me live like God really wants me to live. It'll point out what sin is, but it doesn't give me the power like the Holy Spirit does. And so I look on beyond all of that uh, to Jesus, who is my help. He denounced sin. He denounced the law, which was everything that he had uh, been taught, raised to do. And he lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. We have a tendency to think that the new covenant is all is is this I'm gonna call it cheap grace for lack of a better word. And if you really look at the New Testament and Jesus' definition of what it means to live for the Lord, it would be impossible, even more possible than the six hundred and thirteen laws, right? Uh, and the only way you can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to do the questions. Okay. So question number one, the answer obviously is no. Paul is, does not mean that he's not a Christian just because it states that he is carnal. So in order to answer that, question number two, what does carnal mean? It simply means of the flesh. We're all carnal. Uh, we're all of the flesh. We, have, we live in and then question number three it talks about Paul's inability to do what is good because of lack of desire. Is that true? No, it's not because of lack of desire. And it's not because of lack of knowledge. Here is a man who is probably a genius. I mean, he's picked out, hand-picked to follow, you know, Gamaliel and all of those. Uh, so it's not about a lack of knowledge. The issue then is that the law gives him no power to do good. I'm not saying the law is bad. I'm just saying it's not like the Holy Spirit it doesn't help him to to do to do good. Uh, <clears throat> when it comes to sin, question five: To be saved from sin, a man must at the same time own it, own it and, dis and disown it. I, I like that statement. That's more profound. Uh, as you look at that. So what does the word wretched mean? Worn out, worn out from the struggle. Worn out because of unsuccessful effort. Right? Uh, <clears throat> question seven. Describe what Paul may mean by the statement, who will deliver me from this body of death? How do I get this dead body of death? Yeah. How do I get this? Yeah. Turn to Jesus. Yeah. And what did you say? That's what I would put that, that number eight, I guess. Uh, Paul, Paul in his description about this body of death is, it's, this, it's that illustration about what ancient rulers used to do, is strap this dead body onto somebody. And, and it, it's telling us basically that we, uh, it's a description of this struggle that we've been talking about. Struggle between our carnal, fleshly ways, uh, and how do we live by the Spirit, and, and how do we not sin, or how do we live uh, uh, with the power of the Holy Spirit? Question eight: What's the answer? What's the answer then to the internal struggle with sin? To look, I'm going to change it, Carol. To look to someone besides yourself. It was Jesus, and to not trust in the law or put your uh, your ability it doesn't come from the law, but it comes from Jesus, right? That's how we overcome this.